Hi, and welcome to Northridge. My name is Matt, and we're so excited you could join us today. If you're anything like me, you miss the buzz of a Sunday morning, walking down this hallway and seeing all the smiling, familiar faces. Um, but we know that even though we can't do that at this current time, God is still in control. He is a powerful God who can transform and change lives, even through the power of the internet. And so we want to make sure that you're still staying connected to Northridge as much as possible, even during this time of isolation. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook Premiere, make sure to drop a comment so we can connect with you throughout the service. Or if you're watching this at summer time, we encourage you to send out a message to someone. Um, connect with your small group or connect with us through our social media or our website at nrchurch.ca. We want to make sure that no one goes through this alone and we can all go through this together. Right now, we're going to join into a time of worship, so if you want to stand or sit, uh, let us join together in praising the one true God. In the morning when I rise to meet you In the morning when I lift my eyes you're the only one i want to cling to you're the first thought on my mind let our voices rise oh creation cries singing out in endless hallelujah from this moment on join with heaven's song singing out in endless hallelujah in the moments where you go unnoticed in the ordinary day to day countless miracles of life around us pouring like arrows to your name so let our voices rise oh creation cries Singing out in endless hallelujah from this moment on. Join with heaven's song. Singing out in endless hallelujah. Let our voices 
is rise, oh creation Christ is singing out in endless Alleluia from this moment on we join with heaven's song singing out in endless Alleluia Forever all my 
days Hallelujah Hallelujah Our God reigns Hallelujah Our God God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision, to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. Give me wisdom Cause you know just what to do yeah. Everyone needs compassion Love that's never failing let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a savior The hope of nations Oh savior, he can move the mountain my God is mighty to save He is mighty to save And forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Oh Jesus you conquer the grave You conquer the grave So take me as you find me All my fears and failures And fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in now I surrender Now I surrender Oh Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation Conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory. Of the risen King Oh Jesus Shine your light and Let the whole world see We're singing For the glory Of the risen King Oh 
Oh Jesus, shine your light in, let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Oh Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave Shine your light and let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus, shine your light in, let the whole world see We're singing for the glory of the risen King church I hope you're having a good start to your day I can assure you that I am uh, one of the things you might notice if you're watching on Facebook premiere is you're not going to be seeing uh, David Buzza or we well, might see Northridge Church I don't know who's gonna be monitoring the site but you're not gonna see me chiming in and annoying you by saying good morning to every single person that I see pop in and just a, a quick word about that I don't really know how Facebook Premier works. And so it's funny because I see a lot of people are, are following along and watching the service. But it's only occasionally that I get a little note saying that such and such a person is watching with you. And so if I see your name pop up, I'm going to say good morning. It's like my one and only opportunity to be friendly on a Sunday morning. Um, and if you make a comment, I'm always going to put a little, either a care emoji or something. I, I love it when we can kind of connect that way. And so as a kind of a little aside, just to, again, do your part to develop community, to be a part of something. Chime in. Just let us know where you're watching from. And uh, we'll celebrate that together. Except for this week. Um, my family and I, we are locked down and we're doing a little family weekend. And so I'm not going to be chiming in on our Sunday morning service. Uh, I'll, I'll look at the comments after. But that's why you're not hearing from me today. Uh, I, I'm so excited it, as, as of the moment we're, we're filming right now. Obviously I'm not there, but I'm looking forward to that time of reconnecting, of really being purposeful with our family. Like I said last week, I believe that this is a, a, a section of time we're not going to see again for a long time, maybe in our lifetime, where we have this forced like isolation as a family. And uh, last week, I encouraged you to leverage that opportunity. This week, I'm practicing what I preach and we are taking some time as a family just to hunker down and be together. And so that's why you won't hear from me. Don't call me. Don't email me. I'll see you when I get back. <laughs> when, when we open the doors back to the rest of the world and, and are ready to come out from our little hole. Um, so that's why maybe I'm smiling a little more than usual. But it could be because we're going to get back into the Word today. Last week we taught on baptism. And I want to build on that as we move into this next teaching on this time in the desert where Jesus was away and isolated in prayer and fasting for 40 days 
and, and where he was tempted by the devil himself. Um, let me just elaborate a little bit. And not so much elaborate, but I want to build a bridge from what we taught last week to where we want to go this week. Last week in teaching about baptism, one of the final things we taught about was how baptism is this repentance of sin. You're going one direction and you repent. You change 180 and you're now going, following the path that the Father has for you. And, and that baptism is this act of dying to yourself and being risen again as a new creation. It, it's this model or metaphor for what Jesus did. He took all the sins of the world on him and he was buried in the ground only to defeat death and rise again uh, a new creation. And I want to, in, before we go into this next teaching on temptation, I, I want to build off of what we taught last week and challenge us a little bit more in this notion of dying to ourself. I had a, probably a, a, a mean nothing conversation that, that really impacted me. Uh, Wednesday mornings, as many of you know, uh, the pastors of Maple Ridge, Ridge Meadows, Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge, we gather together. Right now we're having to gather on Zoom, but we gather for a time of prayer. And it's, it's, very, it's a very encouraging time for me. It's a time where I'm together with my brothers who are, share my vocations, share the same uh, highs and lows of ministry, and, and we pray together. And, um, and you know, it, lately, obviously, we're, we're praying that the protocols for COVID will be lifted and that we can, we can get back to doing what God's called us to do. That's kind of the tone. Um, but one of the local pastors is a Nigerian fellow named Pastor Stephen. Absolutely lovely man. He, he leads the church at Trinity Chapel uh, just off of um, the Haney Bypass, right in behind the, the liquor store and, and the gas station there. Good man. Lovely man. Uh, but he told a heartbreaking story of what's happening in Nigeria right now. He has a friend who was a year ahead of him in school, living in Atlanta, and he, he flew back to Nigeria to be with his family for just for a time. But while he was there, he was kidnapped and killed. And Stephen described this, this bigger problem of a, a radical Muslim group who is sweeping through the land with pretty much freedom to commit genocide on the Christians of the land. Basically on all the non-Muslims. Uh, the leader of the country is, uh, is, a, is a, a radical Muslim as well. And he is offering no resistance to this idea of wiping non-Muslims off the planet in his part of the world. And all of a sudden, my prayers to be able to hug my buddy and, and, and go out and, and be with people again, they seemed really small. The trials that we're going through uh, seem really small. And I, I felt very convicted. Sometimes I can get so absorbed in my own little world, in myself and my selfishness, that I lose sight of the bigger picture. And really that's what baptism is. It's dying to ourself. It's putting to death those things that are selfish in us. Uh, you know what? Galatians 2.20 says it perfectly. It says this. Uh, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Sorry, I got a tickle. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what baptism is. It's dying to ourselves. Putting to death our selfishness, our myopic 
perspective of the world and exchanging that for a life for God, a, a life of kingdom living. That's what, what, that's what John was calling us to do. That's what Jesus modeled for us. And that's what he did in Luke chapter 3, which brings us to today in Luke chapter 4. And I'm going to have one more sip of coffee. And uh, just as last week, I want, to, I want to spend some time reading word for word what it says here in Luke 4. And then we'll do a short teaching after that. Uh, let's go Luke 4 verse 1. It says this, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Uh, before we even get into the temptation part, let's just build a bridge historically. Remember, he had come from Galilee to the Jordan, where he encountered John and was baptized. And now, remember, the, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in the form of a dove, like a dove. And Jesus is full of the Spirit in verse 4. And now he goes into the wilderness... Now, this isn't something where he stumbles into the wilderness. This is an intentional journey into the wilderness. Um, uh, Jen McMillan, our church administrator, just returned a book to me. I actually didn't realize he, she had borrowed. Um, it was a book called The Celebration of Discipline. And we had a brief interaction. I asked her what she thought. and She had some interesting thoughts about it. And I shared what I had learned from the book. And two of the things that Richard Foster is the author, two of the things that he, he teaches in this book, Celebration of Discipline, uh, is the discipline of isolation, and the, or the discipline of solitude, and the discipline of silence. And I'm bad at both. <laughs> and, um, but this is what Jesus was engaging in, in Luke 4. He was, he was going out into the wilderness... <laughs> to be by himself for 40 days. Well, I say by himself, but he's going for this intense, intimate time with the Father. A time of prayer and fasting. Um, let me backtrack. I'm going to go right back to the beginning. 4 verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil... And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Makes sense. The devil said to him, so let's pause here for a second. Jesus has been praying and fasting for 40 days. Uh, I don't know how many of you participated in the Foursquare Canada week of prayer and fasting. Um, but I realized what a, how incredibly addicted to food I am. I am a mess without food and without coffee. And I can only imagine after 40 days, the state Jesus was in. So it was a bit of an understatement saying he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now, I, I, there's a couple of pictures that I want to kind of make clear. Um, in fact, let me go on a bit of a tangent. Uh, I don't usually poke around at YouTube to, to see other teachings on what I plan to teach. But I confess to Kara Lee that I found one and I was tempted. I told her, I said, I just kind of want to get everybody to watch this. And perhaps I'll put the link later uh, in our Facebook feed for this teaching. And it's by Tim McKee or Mackay, I'm not sure how you say his name, uh, who is one of the fellows um, responsible for the Bible Project. And he was teaching, I don't know if this is his regular church, he was teaching on the temptation of, of Jesus. And he went into this um, really in-depth teaching uh, of an analysis, analysis of, of historical art depicting the temptation of Jesus. 
and I'm going to dumb it down incredibly what he said to tell you what I learned. He says, if you go to the oldest paintings, the oldest creations of art depicting this moment where, where Jesus is being tempted by the devil, what you find is this, uh, the devil represented as this reptilian, winged, demonic looking creature, which stands to reason. But as time goes on, the art changes. And it's, it's as though the, this, the understanding of how Jesus was tempted changes as well. Instead of this grotesque, demonic, reptilian figure, the more modern or the, the newer paintings, and we're not talking about 1999, we're ta still talking ancient paintings, but the newer of the paintings depict Satan as this friendly, realistic, almost monkish looking character with his arm around Jesus, looking very much like a, a gentle old man. And Tim McKee describes how this understanding of how the enemy works is, is being uh, more, uh, more understood, I guess. Where the devil doesn't come like this freaky serpent trying to talk you into something. He comes in a way that appeals to us. Appeals to our senses. And it's so interesting that the first way the enemy comes to, to Jesus says here, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. We talked last week about how our selfishness is drawn to the things that satisfy the flesh. Well, Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days. And so the idea of, of, uh, of being fed, demonstrating his power, showing the devil who's who, and demonstrating his power to create bread, that just had to have been tempting to his flesh. But this is what Jesus says, verse 4. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. So Jesus' response to this temptation to satisfy the flesh was to quote scripture and just say that's, that's not what we need to live. Verse 5 says, The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If, if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. So the first thing that the enemy uh, kind of tries to seduce Jesus with in this moment of weakness and hunger is food. And then he appeals to the, maybe the next most carnal whim of man, and that's power and authority, glory. And the devil who understands the law knows that this world has been, he's allowed to run it for a while. And he says, all of this can be yours. If only you just bow down to me and worship me. And Jesus responds um, once again with, with scripture. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. Verse 9. Satan tries one more time. He took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written. Now the devil is on to him. And he's now going to quote scripture. He says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. The devil gets really creative. He sees that Jesus is using scripture. This, the devil's going to take scripture and twist it to try and tempt Jesus. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And from that point, from that moment, 
it says the next subheading is that Jesus begins his ministry. Two weeks ago we taught about how Jesus was growing in wisdom, in stature, in favor with man and with God as he grew as a boy, as he learned more about the Father and, and, and interacted with those who were teaching the law and the Bible. And then last week we talked about Jesus being baptized for the repentance of sin, modeling for us what we are to do, even though he had no sin from which to repent. And then he goes on this voyage, this journey into the wilderness for 40 days to eat nothing, but just to spend time with God. And in that time he's, he's tempted by the devil. But all of this is this build up, this building up, fortifying and, and learning and communing with God, this preparation for what God has for him to do. And I, and I, I want us to seize hold of what this can mean. Uh, and so this is a bit of a tangent, but I again, I just feel really compelled to, I, I want to urge you, church, not to gloss over these last months, maybe this last year of COVID. Heaven forbid that this goes on for another year. But if this is what's to happen, if this is what's going to happen, let's take advantage Let's take this time to fortify ourselves, to build ourselves up, to commune with God, to be intimate with God. And I love how Jesus models for us a response to the devil himself. Jesus uses memory verses. He uses the word that he's learned as a child as a rebuttal for the attacks of the enemy. Let me pause and, and remind anybody who doesn't yet know that, that we as a church are, are reading through the Bible together. It's actually our second year where we're doing this together. And you're all invited. The way we're doing it this year is we're reading through the Bible chronologically. So what you'll find is the way we read it isn't in the order of the, of the books of the Bible. It's the historical chronological order in which things happened. And so, as of right now, we're in Exodus, and uh, actually Exodus is a good backdrop for something I want to teach today. But I, I want to encourage you, if you, if you haven't yet joined the, um, the, it's a Facebook group, it's called Northridge, A Year in the Word. Just look that up or email me, david at nrchurch.ca, and I'll help you get connected. This is a great time to be fortifying yourself. While you're isolated, while you can't be out and about, take this time to, to nurture your spiritual life. And, and be like Jesus. Become familiar with his word. So that you're ready when that time comes when we're released back into the wild. So that you're ready to do that. Like I said, I want to take a moment to kind of bring together what we're reading as a church in Exodus and this idea of dealing with temptation. And let me share something first that hopefully you know already. That, that temptation isn't a sin. And let me give you a kind of a, this is a difficult example for many of us. But um, when it comes to sexual sin. God made us with intention. Like he, he purposely gave us a desire, a sexual desire. It's a part of our natural makeup. He built that into us. He created sex and he created us with a desire for it. And so when we have these sexual temptations, and, and this is only one of, uh, of many examples I could use, but it's a, it's a really poignant one, I think. When we have sexual temptations, those in and of themselves are not sinful. However, just as we see Jesus 
stopping it at the source, right? Right there and then, he, he takes what the devil has offered him and he holds up the mirror of truth and says, no, 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 this is the truth. And he quotes scripture. He responds to temptation by bringing it back to what God's truth is. And he stops it right there and then. The devil is stopped dead in his tracks. He will go no farther with Jesus because he has stopped it. So it's not the temptation. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, that didn't make Jesus sinful. In fact, it gave Jesus the arena to demonstrate faith. And he, he turned from the offerings of Satan. I should do it this way because that way has been sin for the last two weeks. So he turns away from the offerings of the stone being turned to bread. He turns away from the offerings of, of the power and the glory. And he turns to what is true. And he models for us how we should deal with temptation. And the way I'm going to bring it back to the book of Exodus, it's this picture of leaving the world they were in, the land of Egypt, where they were enslaved by the powers and principalities of Egypt, and set free by God through the Red Sea, where they, they literally exit this world of slavery into this world of freedom. But it's, again, this repentant moment where they, they 180, they're going this direction, and they turn and they exit into what God has for them. This is our model for dealing with temptation as well. When we are presented with something that usually caters to our, our carnal desires, the things of the flesh that we want and we think we need, like coffee, when we're, we're presented with that temptation, we literally need to turn our back and, and point ourselves towards the truth. And that's how we should deal with temptation. Uh, just a funny story. I was reading a book once upon a time. I've shared this story before with the church. But if you're new, you might not have heard it. Whoops, sorry. Um, there was a, a series of books that came out. Uh, and I think the first one was called Every Man's Battle. And it's talking about um, how men quite often, not exclusively, but they are, are, are in a battle with their self when it comes to sexuality and sexual sin. And one of the recommendations the author gives, and believe what you want about it, was this idea of, of when you're faced with temptation, when your eyes literally see something, he suggests that you bounce your eyes. That you... You physically take your eyes off of what is in front of you, the temptation in front of you, and bounce your eyes. And so, you know what, I was, actually I was reading this book on holiday, which is really ironic because Carolee and I, I can't remember where we were, but we were somewhere where it was hot weather and we were on the beach one, one time after I had just read this. And I had told Carolee what I was learning in the book. And so she knew about this whole bouncing your eyes. And I don't know if she saw my head looking all around because we were walking on the beach and everybody's in bikinis and not wearing a whole lot. And I was practicing bouncing my eyes and, and Carly must know she's like, well, how's it going with the, with the bouncing your eyes? But whether that's a, a good technique or not isn't the point. It's a picture of when you're presented with something that probably satisfies this, this carnal, human, fleshly desire that you have, but you know that God has something different for you. It's that act of turning the other way. And that's what Jesus modeled for us in the three times he was tempted. So the temptation is one thing, but here's where I want to leave you. And I, I keep coming back to this. I believe this is a word for our church. This is an opportunity to go deeper. We, we mentioned the reading of the Bible together. And we'd love to do that with you. But it's also a time to immerse yourself in prayer. 
it's a quieter, slower time. Well, I don't know if it is for you, but it sure is for me. Um, I've only got one of my three kids who is still active in, in sports and stuff, and she's got her L, but I still have to drive her, and I'm a part of the coaching team. And so we're out and about with her soccer, but it's not as busy as it, as it once was. In the past, I had three kids going 100 miles an hour. We are spending more time driving than breathing, I think. But right now is a forced, slower time. There is margin in our life that we can start to use for times of prayer, times of fasting, times of communion and intimacy with the Father. I can guarantee you, this is the David Buzza ironclad guarantee, that time spent with the Father will be time that is, is redeemed, time that is, is um, given back to you in a way that you couldn't give it to yourself. And this is just a, a character trait of God that I find so consistently true. That when we try and do something for God, He flips it. And there's a blessing that comes with it. And I want to encourage you, spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer and communion with the Father. You won't regret it. All right, that's our teaching on Luke 4 today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. I look forward to seeing your comments, uh, having watched this. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please comment in the comment section below there as well. But until the next time where we can see you in real life or see you doing this again, be safe and be blessed. Thanks again for joining us today. Sunday mornings are only tip of the iceberg for what happens here at Northridge. So make sure you stay connected by liking our page on Facebook, following us on Instagram, and check out our website at nrchurch.ca for weekly updates. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week.